really just, I, I'm here to say three things very quickly. First of all, there is a Twitter feed, as you can see on my right-hand side. This is going to be, um, you'll be relieved to hear this is going to be replaced by PowerPoint presentations for those of you who like PowerPoint presentations. The other thing to note is that this is uh, being live streamed as I speak onto the internet and this, these presentations will be available later on um, as something you can view um, on, on probably on YouTube. So um, you don't have to take too many copious notes this afternoon. It should all be presented to you. Um, that's really it from me as an introduction. I'm just here to introduce Wolfgang, Professor Wolfgang Art of the Chinese Outbound Tourism Research Institute, who's going to moderate proceedings this afternoon. Wolfgang. Okay, thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, Mishuman, uh, Pangyuman, Niemann Hao, uh, all to all of you, a good afternoon. Uh, as Tom has been saying, I think we have a very interesting afternoon in front of us. Uh, I hope you all could get hold of a, a program for this afternoon. So we hope that, uh, to introduce you the China Bridge Project and more importantly the EU China Year of Tourism 2018. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to ask uh, our first distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Eric Philippa from the European Commission uh, to give us the official start into the afternoon. Eric, please. Thank you. Um, Tom, did you say that we are uh, we will be on YouTube or? Uh... I imagine so. Yes. Okay, so you 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 will you will edit what I'm going to say because I understood that as a uh, something more intimate than than YouTube. Um, so, yes, the. It needn't be on YouTube if you don't want it to be on YouTube. No, no, it's just that uh, uh, <laughs> I I don't want to be clumsy and and then. Uh, being counterproductive uh, about our, our relation between the EU and China. So I, I just start, there are four buttons, so I'm an, a commission official, so I'm already lost. Usually I'm used to one button. So, and I, I don't see what I see here. Right inside, right inside. Just this one clicks forward. There we are, I think. This is not coming up on the screen. Ah, it's not only me. Okay. Do excuse us. Then you put it on slide. But you push the F5. F5 might do the trick. But basically, I, I'm. Yes. You're there. Ah, very good, very good. And so the. Just, just click the, the, the button. button. Okay, so. Check, check the words. Okay. Yes. So, 2018 EU China Tourism Year. The background. Uh, I'm discussing in front of professionals, so I, I, can, I can go very quickly uh, through those uh, slides. Growing importance of the Chinese visitors, uh, now the third largest uh, group of, of visitors to the European Union after uh, the American, the Russian, American up, Russian down, and the Chinese moving uh, up uh, very strongly. Then we have uh, the, for, for the European Commission, the EU-China tourism year is something that is not a one-shot investment. It's not only about 2018. Many of you are already investing on that market for a long time, uh, but as the European Union, the idea is to go beyond 2018. This is a starting point for us, and just to uh, uh, develop action that uh, will continue in China after 2018. So we are not looking at the latest figure. This is taken from the China National Tourism Administration. I prefer to be candid with you. You have more information than me, so I better share my, my information with, with you. So here we saw the growth of the outbound uh, uh, travels from Chinese citizens, and we see over the last three semesters a flattening. We were, you know, in a, a very strong uh, uh, growing uh, on, a, on a growing trend, and there is some flattening. Of course, these are linked to business cycles, so it's not because we have a flattening over the last two semesters that basically it will stay there. So we are looking to the medium, let, let's forget about the short term, there are different things that may uh, affect 
the short term on the EU side and on the Chinese side, but we are there, we are thinking medium and long term investment. So, uh, Europe, <clears throat> the EU is relevant uh, for the Chinese for a number of, of, of reasons. So, of course, uh, they might be uh, China to his beer with some member states. Denmark or the UK, they were, you know, we heard about uh, 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 some discussion about that. But the Chinese are in particular interested with the European level because they see Europe as a single destination, uh, that Europe is seen as a, a single destination by many uh, Chinese tourists. It's also seen as a single market opportunity by Chinese operators. I have the list of all the tourists tourism assets bought by Chinese companies over the last three years in Europe, it's massive. Uh, and uh, so China is, is looking now and then uh, for pan-European relations because for them it's more manageable to discuss with one interlocutor than 28 member states. They had put uh, uh, in, in place with a former uh, communist country what they call the 16 plus one. Um, a format where a number of countries from Central and Eastern Europe, together with Albania, Montenegro, etc., are having an annual meeting of heads of states and government, 16 com European countries on one side and one Chinese interlocutor. So uh, the EU is attractive for, for, for all those reasons. Uh, and this shows, by, uh, this shows by the number of CNTA, China National Tourism Administration overseas offices. Many of them are actually in Europe. So uh, we are uh, a, ma a main destination for Chinese uh, uh, tourists. They know that and they are interested in pan-European opportunities. There is an EU added value for us uh, on, on, on this side in, in Europe. Uh, first, that contrary to what happened with many member states, the EU has an annual summit at the level of the president, the Chinese president, next time June in, in, in Brussels. So we have a moment, an annual moment, where we can discuss things in a joint statement. We can raise issues. Uh, uh, and this, it was on one of those opportunities that the EU-China Tourism Year was, was announced. Um, the EU also can, can be useful through financial leveraging. So. The European Commission is aligning uh, funding for cooperative marketing, for B2B, business-to-business -business matchmaking, that are not only about outbound tourists, but also inbound tourism, not only about tour operators and travel agencies, but uh, for whatever is interesting uh, in the tourism value chain. But we start uh, with tour operator and travel uh, agents. So these actions are not only about you, but largely about you. Uh, hence my presence and hence the, 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 the choice of, of this, this moment to launch, you know, the, uh, or, or campaign to mobilize the industry for the EU-China tourism year. So financial leverages, EU money, but then a number of member states, a number of region in the member states, a number of DMOs at city level are interested to chip in for that EU-China tourism year. And, and with that, we can go to the private sector. And we are with the European Travel Commission, Visit Europe, we are uh, thinking of a business model where public money will be matched with private money, just to be strong, uh, to have high ambition about China. The EU is also interesting in terms of its regulatory leverage. Uh, when you have a population of 10 million inhabitants and you discuss with China, there is an asymmetry uh, uh, across the table. With the EU, that asymmetry is not of the same magnitude. Uh, so we have, in particular, a roadmap with China on visa facilitation. The US. Uh, largely unilaterally uh, granted uh, Chinese travelers the possibility of a multi-entry visa of well, a 10 years long multiple entry visa after the first single visa being properly uh, uh, used. 10 years. Uh, Australia is uh, unrolling the same initiative and as a Chinese visitor 
you can apply online and in Chinese for the Australian visa. So here, the visa, of course, we are in the UK, it's UK and Ireland are a special case, but the Schengen visa, the visa code applied to all the other member states and beyond. Norway, Iceland, etc. So this is something where we have with, the, uh, with China, we have a roadmap on visa facilitation and those negotiations should start soon. The EU-China tourism year is seen as an opportunity to progress, to make faster prog fast progress with that, uh, and we discussed that last week with our Chinese uh, counterpart. So they, this is an event that can deliver some visa facilitation, hopefully, and that would be a game changer. Uh, so we have also sectoral dialogue about market access, but we don't want to discuss uh, uh, those issues today. So a unique opportunity. China Tourism Year is something we don't practice. Well, I'm discussing with our, our, our American, uh, my, my, my American counterpart, they said, well, we, for us, every year is China year. Every year is Europe year. So the China Tourism Year is something that is coming from Beijing. It's an important part of their cultural diplomacy, their people-to-people -people dialogue. They also know that they are sending more Chinese tourists to Europe, that we are sending European tourists to, uh, to China. But they are comfortable with that. So we also, we study what the Chinese government and the industry did for previous China, China Tourism Year. And clearly, they do more when the interlocutor, the other party, is uh, big. So when you compare what happened with the Mexico-China tourism year and the US-China tourism year, it speaks volume. We don't need to go into details, but for instance, for the US-China tourism year, 2016, this year, 1,000 delegates, American, they, they, they made a number of actions. One of those actions were, were 1,000 American on the Great Wall inviting 1,000 delegates from the industry, etc., all on a big show on the, uh, uh, the, the Great Wall, and then splitting those, those 1,000 Americans into a smaller group just to make visa f uh, um, uh, tra tra travel, well, um, just specific travel to, to make them to, so that they would discover uh, unknown side in, in China. This did not happen with Mexico. So the EU, comes with the advantage of coming for 28 member states. And when we say the EU, we are not sure the European Union, that acronym means something in, for all Chinese average travelers. So we have worked on, on, on logo, where EU are the two first bold and letter of Europe, so they know what, what we are uh, after. And, and therefore, we can expect, if we are ambitious, if we invest a lot, the Chinese will reciprocate and will facilitate our work in China. So this is just the chronology, which is uh, uh, not very relevant, but so July, the agreement with the Chinese Prime Minister and President Juncker, President of the European Commission, uh, their agreement about the 2018 being uh, EU-China tourism year was made public. Uh, we, um, my commissioner, European commissioner, is in charge of the uh, internal market, which includes so all industrial and service uh, sector, including tourism. So she is also flagging that we have high ambition. She did that on the occasion of a European ministerial meeting. It's part of the, the thing that are attractive for the for our Chinese uh, counterpart. We have more than one capital. So instead of having one flash mob in Washington, they, they can have 28 flash mobs uh, showing Chinese culture throughout Europe. So. Today, 3rd of November, important element. It's the first time that we, we speak to the, uh, to the industry uh, publicly. We have started a, a, few, a, a few exploratory conversations, but time is ripe for us. We need that lead time. Our objective, as I say, inbound, outbound, uh, they will be, part of the program will be institutional. We need to have an official opening, possibly with very high, uh, well, it happened that uh, uh, the Chinese president attend that or their prime minister, so we are aiming high for the opening and for the closing. Then you have the business-to-business -business, uh, action, largely uh, matchmaking. Eduardo Santander will discuss that. And then we have the B2C, business-to-consumer. To, to uh, this is only one plus, but we have high ambition. So one plus here means still uh, a, a lot of things 
uh, we intend to do. I will show you, um, for instance, uh, we have started working on a logo with the European Travel Commission with Visit Europe. Uh, we have already promotional videos that we show the Chinese. Uh, we have a number of things that uh, basically imp impress the Chinese because we are ahead of them. Of course, we are not a centralized state. When the president says something, not everybody starts implementing that. We need that lead time for bottom-up uh, preparation. Uh, one, one important thing is to become more attractive for Chinese visitors. So uh, security is an issue. Uh, at all levels, extra measures are taken, but we still need to reassure our Chinese visitors. Uh, and then there is the, uh, the way we welcome them. So we have a number of interesting initiatives. For instance, Shinavia, the contraction of China and Scandinavia, they use European regional funds to develop something that make Helsinki, Copenhagen, uh, uh, etc., more attractive by knowing how to welcome signage banks, etc. We have, uh, uh, as part of the World Bridge Tourism, uh, a company uh, recognized by uh, in, in China by the Chinese Tourism Academy, uh, Welcome, Welcome Chinese, that is about that, just certifying hotel, airport, etc., uh, and, and indicating that, yes, they are ready to, to get to welcome properly a Chinese visitor, we will support that. So, our assets, we know our assets, uh, the US, China Tourism Year, the US is selling their national parks, we are selling our cultural heritage, but also our national parks, Finland is doing that very effectively, I don't need to list that. Uh, we are looking for a win-win approach with China. Uh, if we facilitate their work, and for instance, we approaching the Association of, of Museums, European Museums, to facilitate the, uh, the work of our Chinese partners. Uh, we will invite a number of Chinese uh, operators to attend the B2B matchmaking, so it will be a win-win uh, approach with China. At the end of the day, because there are way more Chinese coming to uh, Europe than, than vice versa, if we increase the flow by five, six percent in absolute numbers, this will be good for Europe. So, uh, how to make the most of it? Ah, that I should. This is an example of uh, what we are using to sell Europe. This is an example of that base for the um, cooperative marketing campaign we are thinking of. So we have a number of iconic places. We can add those regions, those cities interested to have extra visibility, will have an entry ticket at a discount price because this is already paid by EU money. So visit Europe, you have a platform, you can have more. What is still missing is a number of Chinese independent travelers appearing now and then, but that will be the work of the European Travel Commission to edit that, so it's a start. So we were last week in China and we will go back each time while well, we have a commissioner, a vice president, a president to attract uh, the, well, th these are the occasion of institutional meetings, but more than that. So now uh, we have the equivalent of our vice minister that is a, a celebrity on the Chinese national television, on the uh, social media and um, 
and, and on the traditional press, and this on the occasion of a first visit to China. This is another example of what we can have once we have um, a logo. We are looking at the logo for the moment. Uh, we have one logo. The problem is that we have more than one great wall. Finding one iconic uh, uh, place is uh, uh, representing the entire union is impossible. So here, the idea is we pick a few gateways, places that mean something in China, but this logo comes against the movie or with the video I just show you that show more gateways and the idea is that what the Brand USA is doing very effectively is to the gateways through and beyond the gateway. So this is the same approach. That might be the logo. We want to go fast forward with adopting a logo uh, or, or, or Chinese counterpart uh, like that. The idea of mirroring uh, their iconic uh, places with or so we will see. This is part of what we are doing. Building strong coalition, we have a large, we want to go fast, 2018 is tomorrow. So we are building a coalition of the willing and able. So not all member states are interested in China, there is no problem. Not all member states are interested in uh, Alpine agriculture. So this is part of the EU, it's uh, uh, different things that uh, are part of a package. So we have many member states uh, with us, national tourism offices. Uh, we are working also with the world, the UN uh, uh, World Tourism Organization around the Silk Road with UNESCO to develop trans-European route around UNESCO World Heritage that are uh, not well known, but might be attractive to uh, China. We will be present in a number of trade fairs. That the B2B that Eduardo will discuss of. So building strong coalition, uh, we have just to have a case, just to test the water uh, and to go in China, uh, to China with concrete example, we have discussed with a number of European airlines, including uh, Finnair, uh, Thomas Cook, uh, uh, and their joint venture with Fossum, uh, uh, cons the Chinese consortium, the Guin Michelin, etc. We have already a very strong interest for that, and I'm hoping that at the end of this, this conversation, sorry, I did not sleep much, but uh, uh, l l last night, but I hope that I will raise your interest despite my my kind of flat <coughs> allocation uh, for the moment. This is an example of what Thomas Cook uh, is is uh, could could do, for instance, uh, on the base of the experience with uh, Brand USA. But I say these are exploratory talks. Uh, so, and uh, all definition of, of you know looking for partners. All definition of partners. When we say European partners, we don't we don't seem, we don't limit ourselves to European companies with um, majority shareholders that are still in European hands. Uh, Brand USA is very uh, is very pragmatic. They are open to any partners active in the U.S. and interest in cooperating. For instance, Lufthansa is one of the partners of Brand USA. Sina, uh, the big Chinese online media company, is a partner of Brand USA. Uh, the idea is to adopt the same pragmatic uh, approach. So these are just examples. I'm not reading that example of what the program could look like uh, with institutional B2B, B2C events at different levels. Uh, to finish on an example, I'm in contact with the 2018 European Capitals of Culture. Malta just signed a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, China to be prepared. Uh, in the Netherlands, the, uh, uh, the European Capital of Culture is betting on the kind of Amsterdam look plus happening, interesting for individual travelers. They are inviting a number of uh, chi Chinese artists. So this, this is what it would look like, a number of EU events, but then macro regional events, state event, uh, and we will aggregate that in, in an impressive uh, program. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and uh, enlightening presentation. I think we all got a good overview about the many initiatives. And uh, so may I ask uh, our next speaker, and we get an address from the European Parliament from Mr. Ishvan Oheli, who himself unfortunately is not able to join us today, but uh, he sent uh, a colleague who will 
uh, give uh, his letter to us, uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Attila Benedek. I'm transport and tourism advisor of Istvan Uyhai from the European Parliament. And I'm personally really happy to be here with you today. I would like to share the letter what uh, Istvan sent to you and all of you got it at the reg registration. And uh, personally, I would like to start uh, the real happiness because this is the uh, event and this is the example when you see that the European Union works. The two institutions, the European Parliament initiated an idea, and after that, the European Commission implemented this, and now we are here together, and we are listening how we can manage this. So the EU works. So let me share you the letter of Mr. Uyhei. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, at the moment of my election as member of the European Parliament, I decided to concentrate on two relevant issues, namely tourism and EU-China relations. I promised uh, actions instead of empty promises and speeches from my side. Adhering to my commitment with my colleagues, we initiated just one week after taking off my duties in July 2014, the World Bridge Pilot Projects. We are extremely proud that after long discussions, we succeeded to convince the European Commission about the importance of attracting more and more tourists from China. I'm very happy that after several pitches I made at high-level meetings in China and in Europe, top decision makers recognized this huge potential for development. Hence, the first EU-China Tourism Year announced by Commission President Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker and Chinese Premier Mr. Li will be a historic opportunity to build bridges and enhance our cultural, economic and touristic partnership with China. I'm really glad that I can contribute to this special year to be organized in 2018 on behalf of the European Parliament's Tourism Task Force, where I'm the leader. Moreover, with important partners from the business and tourism sector, we established the new association, uh, the Europe-China One Belt, One Road Cultural and Development Committee. It aims to create a high-level network between European and Chinese partners with great experience in diplomacy, business and politics, with a special focus on culture and tourism in the framework on, of the One Belt, One Road OBOR project. The OBOR committee will be also one of the main supporters of the upcoming EU-China Year of Tourism. Let me also mention a few of other tourism-related initiatives that are currently on the agenda in the European Parliament and beyond. We suspect there are some elements in them that are of interest for most of you. This year in the Transport Committee, uh, where I am Vice Chair, we had a new proposal, the Initiative of European Capital of Tourism, similarly to the European Capital of Culture project, which aims to award the title for a duration of one year to cities or regions that present a sustainable plan for improving their touristic appeal. Needless to say, that cooperation with the European Travel Commission and ITOA members will be vital to the success and longevity of this program. Last but not least, I have been from the beginning one of the main driving force behind the free interrail ticket project for every young European turning 18. Such a project is not merely about enjoying a free train ride, but opening up Europe for young people across the continent to deepen integration and enhance cross-cultural experiences and communication. Continuing this thought, if you have any ideas proposals, initiatives that can be the foundations of any of our cooperations, please do not hesitate. My door is always open. Should you have any further questions or comments, you are always more than welcome to contact me at, uh, or my office. That's me. I wish you a fruitful and productive meeting. Thank you very much. Istvan Uyhei. Thank you very much. Okay, seems this one's not working. Okay, so well, thank you very much uh, for giving us this letter, and uh, so uh, we are happy to hear that there are supporters on many levels, also on very high levels of what we are doing here. So uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, ask uh, Jennifer Edu on the stage. So she's the head of research of uh, ETC, and she will talk. Uh, about the size and the potential of the Chinese outbound market. And uh, af uh, after that, the, the second part of the presentation will be done by Tom Jenkins, uh, the CEO of uh, ITOA. Jennifer, please. Thank you very much. 
I'm, I'm aware of the time constraints, so I'm going to be as fast as possible. Um, when we talk about the Chinese outbound market, we're talking about growth potential, opportunities, we're talking about cooperation. We're talking about an outbound market that has been growing over the past years. And already going back in time, UNWTO forecasted that the, the volume of outbound travel from China would reach 10 million by 2020, and this milestone has already been surpassed in 2014. Um, nevertheless, in terms of growth, we can see how it's been slowing in the past um, few years. And it's also very important to bear in mind that Chinese urban travel is mainly focused or it originates, it's, um, it takes place mostly within Asia. And after Asia, it's Europe that holds the highest share of Chinese urban travel, followed by um, the Americas and other regions. Um, this chart speaks by itself. We can see how um, international tourist arrivals from China has been growing over the past decade. And only in 2015, this number reached 10 million tourist arrivals from China, which was up 23% compared to the previous year. And um, based on data, on latest available data, this number already halfway through the year has already reached 10 million, and we're still expecting further growth towards the end of the year. Europe, of course, attracts 13% um, of Chinese outbound flows, and we do expect as well this number to continue on the same growing trend towards 2020, reaching up to 14%. And as we can see also in, in, in the graph on the left side, um, the regions that attract, uh, that are more um, appealing for Chinese travelers are, of course, Western Europe and Central Eastern Europe. In terms of the top destinations for Chinese travelers, uh, we can see how France and the Russian Federation are the most attractive destinations for them. However, the rest of the, of the most appealing destinations are of course ETC destinations and altogether attract a higher number of Chinese travelers than France and Russia combined. Um, the list is of course completed by Germany, Switzerland, Austria and popular Mediterranean destinations like Spain, Turkey, Italy, or Greece. Um, something that's also widely acknowledged is that um, China is the highest spender in terms of international tourism expenditure. Since 2012, we have all witnessed the ninth consecutive year of growth in terms of international expenditure from this market. Only in, 20, in 2015, this market spent, um, well, the, the international tourism expenditure reached 292 billion US dollars, which was an increase of 25% compared to the previous year. It's also very important to highlight some aspects that are impacting either in the positive or in the negative way um, outbound flows from, from China. For example, in terms of economic factors, we should not forget about the devaluation of the currency, of the slowing economy, and there are, of course, doubts on how this will impact outbound flows from China. Another important factor as well is the expanding middle class of, of China. Um, the boom of China's upper middle class will, of course, be one of the most powerful in the development of China in the coming years and it's expected to impact the tourism industry, infrastructures, and businesses alike. This will, of course, mean that there will be a significant raise in the number of Chinese travelers that can, of course, afford leisure travel. In terms of political and policy factors, I'm just going to go very quickly. Um, one of the aspects that's important to, to mention is the government's anti-corruption and anti-extravagances policy, and this has already impacted several sectors, including the one of tourism, in the sense that there are now more stricter controls in terms of um, authority of um, officials' expenses, travel expenses. Other factors would be, for example, um, um, Chinese citizens, they're entitled to less holidays compared to Europeans. However, they do have more public holidays. And the two important ones, for example, are the Chinese New Year and the Chinese National Day. And the important thing of these two main holidays is that uh, virtually the whole Chinese population will be tra traveling for an entire week during this period. Um, 
other lifestyle factors, for example, we are in front of a new Chinese traveler who is resulting for China's expanded middle classes. This new profile of Chinese traveler is much more demanding and is much more consumer oriented and they're now going to expect more and demand more from tourism destinations and they're looking for now um, authentic experiences and immersing in local culture of the destination where they travel to. In terms of destination side factors, we will be talking, of course, about easier visa procedures. And we've been also um, witnessing how countries around the world have simplified visa procedures. For example, the UK has cut visa fees and opened more visa application offices in China. Also, destination management organizations are adapting their products and services to the Chinese traveler, and they're also making them um, available through specific uh, different media channels and also to different locations. They're going much more digital, and they're also providing contact in Chinese. And, of course, we should not forget about improved air connectivity. And on the downside, we also have to very, bear in mind very important um, risks in terms of safety, safety and security in the Europe and how this will also impact outbound flows from China to our region. And uh, finally, in ETC, we do understand that the Chinese market is a very important one. And for this reason, we continue doing, uh, investigating this market, monitoring it through different studies and through different reports as well. And for example, uh, the Chinese urban travel market report, also through our quarterly reports and our, our long call travel sentiment index that investigates the intention to travel to Europe from key important markets, including China. And one important key message would be that China has a huge growth potential and in general, European destinations do need to join forces and work together for a better promotion of Europe as a tourism destination for this market. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And that's it. Thank you. Wow. Jennifer, thank you so much for the presentation and uh, for keeping in mind our time, but I think still uh, lots of dense uh, information and uh, Tom will add to this. I, th I th thought you said dance inf information. I was wondering what I was supposed to do next. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You've just heard a um, very sophisticated and informed presentation. You're now going to hear something from me. Um, how do I get on there? Try to open it up. Right, this is humiliating. Where is it? Got it. Brilliant. Right. Um, there was a long haul travel sentiment in text, um, and they did a quick survey of people who are experienced travelers, and they just wanted, uh, I, mean, I have this data, so I'm sharing it with you. Um, what they were saying is that um, of all the countries that they surveyed, China is the one with the most propensity to view travel to Europe favorably. Now this comes couched with hundreds of caveats, but just to say that amongst the traveling classes in China, Europe looks good. More interestingly, um, they also did a particular graded survey on a date line, and you can see that there's an evolution of intention, to, sorry, um, intention to travel outside China, which is that gray line, and the orange line is uh, Europe positive intention. What's interesting about this is it echoes slightly what um, Eric was saying earlier. You can see this orange line is going down slightly. This is obviously not good news, but it's also very interesting news because up until now, it's widely been perceived that the Chinese market has been dominated by the mice sector and by, the, by the, effectively the works outing sector. What we're seeing evidence of here is the rise of the discriminating, selective Chinese traveler who is prepared to go to Europe on their own volition and is also prepared not to go on their own volition. Just place something in context. Um, Crikey, what's going to happen here? All right, it's a whole load of missing information. Brilliant. 
Um, so, such little time, it just shows you that China, which is, that ye um, which is uh, the, the, the yellow slither right up at the top, um, is a tiny proportion of the business of tourism within Europe. I just want, everyone's going to be talking about China at the moment, but the, 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 the context of Chinese tourism is one where um, the, you, you've got to appreciate that it actually represents a very, very small part of the industry in which we work. It's vitally important, all markets are important, but don't let's start getting carried away with the idea that the whole market is gonna turn Chinese, it isn't. It's always gonna represent a fraction of our business. The other thing to realize, um, and you, you can go around Europe and find people fantasizing about the quantities of Chinese business they're gonna get, is that less than 1% of the Chinese population has visited Europe. And that means that the greatest growth de facto, we've got 99% of the population haven't been here yet, the greatest growth is going to be in first-time visitors. Now, first-time visitors, ladies and gentlemen, are interested in the prime destinations of Europe. They're not going to be interested in wonderfully interesting, no doubt, and terribly worthwhile, deeply regional attractions. They're only going to be interested in the big stuff. That's what they're coming here for. And so you're going to find that in those destinations, the proportion of growth from China is going to be higher. So you're going to see more concentration in the main centers. And you'll notice that if you look at the growth patterns that we have here, and this is a chart, if you can read it, with Paris on the left-hand side and London on the left-hand side, you'll see that the percentage growth in Chinese bed nights in major European cities, 2015 versus 2014, and we know that 2016 is going to show a very different picture, you'll see the biggest growth effectively is in Paris and London. There's startling growth for Budapest, but you must realize that um, you're looking at something starting from a very low base. Um, that doesn't mean to say that you're not getting no growth anywhere else, and this is a, an interesting chart, which is, just shows you a swathe of Europe on the outside of the main Chinese destinations, where they are seeing uh, positive growth, but you will note that this growth isn't quite as large as the growth posted in the main destinations. Second tier cities, and this is just a run of them, you will notice the growth is very healthy. What's, all this shows you that in second, broad second tier cities, Chinese growth is outgrowing the USA. And this is not going to be too shocking for many of you in this room, but this really just confirms that notice. And for those of you who are very familiar with Switzerland in this room, you will not be surprised that the greatest growth is in uh, Lucerne. Try and get a non-Chinese group into Lucerne at the moment. Quick story, very fast. Um, you are very familiar of the tale of the man who invented chess and the Indian king. We were in, well, we'll call him Indian. This is a uh, indeed, an Indian miniature with a Mughal background. Um, and famously, the, the king said, well, you know, how can I reward you? And the, the man said, well, I just want one grain of rice on the chessboard and the second grain of, second square of the chessboard, I want two and four on the third and just keep doubling it as you go along. And as you know, um, by the time they hit the 64th square, there were, I can't even read this, um, it's somewhere in the region of 18 trillion 446,744 trillion, anyway, it goes on, 500 billion metric tons of rice for a thousand years of world rice production was actually on that chessboard. Allegedly, the man got killed by the king for his impudence. Oh, I think he was asked to count each grain of rice. That's what he was asked to do. Uh, why I'm telling you this is that, um, according to Bartlett, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. This is a cartoon of a train trying to climb up the human growth curve, um, the population growth curve. And the most obvious application of the exponential function at the moment is Moore's law. And the point, this shows you growth in um, trans microprocessor transistor counts from 1971 to 2011. And it looks like it's a straight line, but the, the chart on the left is a log-log curve and you know perfectly well that the microprocessor count on every um, chip doubles every two years and halves in cost. And what that means in practical terms, and we've been experiencing it, is that all the progress in travel transactions that we've seen, all the advances, all the transformation in the last 30 years 
has the potential to be duplicated in the next two. So everything we've, all the change we've seen up until now can be duplicated against two and quadrupled in the next four. So you're looking at a totally transformational uh, um, capacity of the travel system. It doesn't happen, of course. I've been sitting here for nigh on 18 years, and nothing like the transformation that was supposed to have happened in the travel industry has happened. Why? I think the biggest block is the legacy of consumer behavior. People are, it's a tautology, but people are accustomed to dealing in ways that they are used to. It takes a big shift to stop booking with a travel agent and booking online. And established players fight to retain market share, and they have a welcoming audience of satisfied customers. So established markets are inherently static, even with a dynamic um, technological footprint. China is not an established market. Very important to realize that when you're looking at China. In 20 years, it's moved from being a very poor command economy to being one of the most dynamic consumer countries on earth. Because products and distress distribution systems have to be new. They're inherently new in this environment. There is no legacy system in place, only a hunger for what technology can deliver. And if you look at Chinese smartphone users, this is a, um, obviously not an exponential graph for those of you who collect these things, it's obviously a straightforward arithmetic progression, but you'll notice that the growth of this up to 2021 goes from four, over 400 million up to over 700 million in 2021 is the prediction. This is effect, not half the population. If you strip out the significant part, part of the population still in China, about 10%, which is profoundly poor, and you strip out a large quantity of the people living in deeply rural areas, as far as the metropolitan population is concerned, this is 100% saturation. Um, everyone frankly has a mobile phone now in, in, in somewhere like Beijing and everybody will have one in two or three years time. What this means in um, product terms is that the growth of mobile third party payment in China is just breathtaking. Um, up at the moment it's running at about 50% a year. 50% growth in mobile phone payment. That means effectively 100% of Chinese visitors coming over here are smartphone users, and it's normal for them not to carry cash or a credit card. They use Alipay and WeChat universally. Even in street markets for street food or street stores, they use their mobile phones to purchase. And it's not just a payment tool. Something like Alipay deals, presents itself uh, with discounts, deals at merchants, reviews, recommendation for other, from other consumers. It's this kind of lifestyle super app. The mo mobile ordering is now worth over $300 billion a year. It's unimaginable fast progress on a consumer front. The search, shop, and buy share proportion of the online market in China is the highest in the world. If you look at these, the, the, the orange bar is when people go online and look where they're gonna go on holiday. The, the, the shop one is the, where they go around searching uh, for who they're going to buy from. The blue line is where do they actually buy it from, and the green line is who they share it with online, how many people share their, their, their experience of holiday online. China leading the world on sharing. There's a hunger for person-to-person -person interconnectivity taking place in China, and it's expressing itself on the mobile phones. Conclusion on all these discussions, very quickly. When you're looking at something like this, I think the question you ask yourself is not what we can get from China, like how much money can we get off them, nor really what we're gonna, we ought to do for them, though that is important and is, is coming up in a minute. The question I'm just posing to you is what can we learn from this process? Because we learn from visitors. In the 1950s and 60s, the arrival of the Americans in volume in Europe required ensuite facilities, air conditioning, and catering that met their tastes. And this transformed the service economy, or that bit of the service of economy that we use in Europe. 1970s and 80s, we must never forget the impact of the Japanese demanding an attention to detail and courtesy, which we were really weren't that used to handling at the time. 
The rise of the Chinese industry uh, in the world has transformed the West's industrial base. I don't think there is a, an industrial economy in uh, the Western Hemisphere that's not been affected by the rise of Chinese industrial goods. And it's transformed the raw material supply chain and Western consumer choice. We hugely benefit from goods that we import from China and the cost that, that they can be obtained at. I think as important will be the rise of the Chinese consumer. And the Chinese consumer arriving in Europe armed far more advanced than we are in terms of their technical capacities is going to be the big impact that this market will have on us. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer, Tom, thanks again for this uh, overview and for widening uh, us as a scope of uh, what we are looking at. So uh, now it is my turn to go to the lecture myself and give you some more points. Uh, let me see how, how we can, okay, take that one. Okay, this one is working, yes, very good. Uh, so just bear with me to change the presentation. Here we should be, okay. Okay, here we are. So, uh, I'm fully aware of the fact that I'm standing be between uh, the coffee break and you, so I will also try. Uh, being a professor, it's very hard to be brief, but I will try my best. Uh, so, my topic is the evolution of the Chinese visitor, and uh, obviously this will reflect and hopefully uh, add a bit to some of the things which have been said by my uh, distinguished colleagues before. Uh, just briefly, uh, yeah, I'm the head of Kotri, which is the China Upon Tourism Research Institute based in Hamburg and Beijing. And I've been around quite some time uh, working in this topic. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is um, present to you eight theses and an outlook at the end about the evolution of the Chinese visitor. The first one, uh, Reflecting what, what Eric has been saying in the beginning uh, is that obviously this whole development is part of uh, China playing a more active role in the world than it used to for, for many years. So we can see this with the One Road, One, one Belt, One Road program. Uh, we have seen in the last years Chinese government has paid a lot of money to establish Confucius Institutes, so uh, similar to British Council or a Good Institute all over the world. Uh, we see Chinese soldiers as uh, blue helmets. We see just recently again Chinese, what they call taikonauts, uh, going to their own uh, space station and uh, the Chinese are uh, right, quite uh, confident that they will beat the Americans to bring the first man or woman on Mars and so on. And also, of course, what we are discussing today, we are celebrating today the beginning of the 2018 uh, EU-China tourism year is an element in, in this. And uh, already, as was mentioned, the 16 plus 1 uh, program is another part. And actually, uh, this weekend, Mr. Li Keqiang, the Premier of China, will meet the 16 tourism ministers of all the Central and Eastern European countries uh, in Riga. And I have the pleasure to give a keynote speech, speech there uh, day after tomorrow. And which, so this is a cooperation which is uh, not only about tourism, also about uh, transportation, science education, so on, but tourism plays an important role in that. So, and when we look at the One Belt, One Road initiative, you can see that the European Union uh, in particular is one of the uh, addressees of, of this development. And if we look at uh, the investment of China, so China going out in the world, we can see that Europe uh, has had one of the biggest shares of the Chinese total investment in, in the last uh, 10 years, and uh, so we have this CEC uh, development, and if we look at the Chinese outbound foreign direct investment only last year, so these are the numbers for 2015, you can see the dramatic increase, and you can also see, this is the, in blue, this is the investment for the Louvre hotels, 1,100 hotels which were bought by a Chinese group, and you have the, the Club Met, uh, bought by Fosan, and in 2016, this year, this has continued uh, with a lot of 
purchases in, in the tourism, in entertainment, including a number of uh, British Premier League football clubs, and so on and so on. So there is a much more active role. The uh, soft power has been mentioned as one of the words to look at. So all this, what we are discussing here, is based on the uh, interest of China to have uh, its voice heard in the world much more, and the Chinese tourists are part of this development. So when we look at the uh, Chinese travelers, what, what has happened, uh, obviously, since 2012, that's why we're all here, China's the biggest uh, international tourism source market, but what is significant that this year will be the first time that less than half of these trips end in Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan. So what's called Greater China. So more than half of these trips will go beyond, uh, which is of course good news for us here in, in Europe. And uh, the spending, whatever is the level, you can find all kinds of numbers. Uh, so our number is 220 billion for this year as a forecast. Uh, the number certainly will rise. So maybe if you have been following uh, the, the numbers, uh, there were some shocking news, look at this, uh, that uh, in the first half of 2016, the growth rate of China Upper Tourism was 3.4 percent, not 15, 18, 25, 3.4. So this is, of course, scary, but uh, fortunately, I can tell you, this is exactly because Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan uh, had a significant drop in arrivals. So this is what you can see, uh, the red part uh, going going down already in 15 and, and uh, getting smaller first half of 16. But the blue part, the rest of the world, uh, has been making up for that. So actually, uh, in the first half of 2016, uh, Greater China lost about 2 million arrivals, and Japan, South Korea, and Thailand gained about 2 million arrivals. So the, the Chinese have not stopped traveling abroad, but they are going further for a number of reasons uh, than before. And so this is for everybody who is not invested in Greater China, uh, a positive development. We have seen this graph before. So we get about 10 million of the, of the arrivals. And uh, Tom has been saying that uh, we get 1% uh, of the Chinese population. But don't forget uh, the number of Chinese who have a passport represent 5% of the Chinese population. So when we talk about the Chinese here, we talk about 5% of the population. So out of these, 20% uh, or so have already been here. So we have been growing approximately with the total growth of the market. Uh, in absolute numbers, of course, that means that we broke, have been breaking the, the 10 million number. So the last year was a very good year for Chinese open tourism to, to, to Europe for the big destinations. Uh, my country, Germany, got 36% year on year. Uh, but we can see that with the development, which has been mentioned before, of the Chinese tourists who have been already taking off the main destinations, already have been on the Eiffel Tower, already have been here in London, have been to, uh, to Rome and, and to Berlin, uh, more and more go to the smaller places. And we saw last year uh, impressive growth rates. You see, can read them up there for a number of the smaller places. So Slovakia, of course, from a small level, doubled arrivals. Iceland is one of the big hits. Uh, Prague got more than 200,000 arrivals. So this is more than most European countries have. Uh, so we see this is fueled by what we call the second wave. So those uh, Chinese travelers who come here repeatedly, uh, partly because they have business here, partly because their kids are, studi uh, are students uh, in Europe, and, and so on. So most of these coming from the first tier cities, Beijing, Beijing Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. And so these are the people we can uh, have as, as a customers uh, also in smaller places. So the third point to mention is we see a diversification. So unfortunately, the answer to the question, what does the Chinese tourists want, is wrong question. The Chinese tourist does not exist. And uh, it's not surprising having 10 million arrivals that they are not all the same. And we see, simply speaking, we still have the mass market. And yes, 
there will be still a, a huge number of first-time travelers who are rushing around looking at uh, eight countries in 10 days and are mostly concerned about uh, cheap prices and uh, uh, being able to say afterwards, yeah, I joined the club, I have also have been to Europe now. Uh, but what we see that more and more, and this is a people who spend more money and who stay longer in one place uh, and are more, we can be interest them in, in thematic special topics, are those people who uh, are traveling repeatedly and are interested in authentic experiences and local culture. So, uh, okay, I, I will skip that. So, and just briefly looking how this has been happening, and uh, this is indeed a development which is, uh, has been happening over a few decades, so that we see from the first starts in the 1980s uh, and uh, development in the 1990s, where when I was earning my money with uh, organizing Chinese delegations, business delegations coming to Europe, uh, we see only since the beginning of, of uh, this century, leisure travel in, in a big way. And uh, so we had, in November 14, with the 10-year USA multiple uh, entry visa and the follow-up in all the other uh, major destinations, like a domino effect, uh, a major game changer. Now with multiple entry vi uh, visa, you don't need a tour operator anymore, uh, for sure, so you can travel uh, at short notice uh, and can travel several times shorter, uh, which is more fitting to what the Chinese market uh, can do. So, so we see a, a change from going to the must-see uh, places, going and even within countries uh, that France does not mean only Paris anymore and that uh, UK does not mean only London anymore. Uh, so and that instead of confirmation of the postcard, what you are expecting, uh, so you see uh, tourists going to the places they're interested in. That might be uh, in Manchester, uh, the football stadiums of Manchester United and Manchester City, uh, uh, or nature, national parks, a uh, big way. And we also see that these people are not afraid anymore of the number four. They don't run away if they give them a hotel room which has a number four. They do not insist on a hot water kettle anymore. And they're just discovering Airbnb or caravaning as alternative ways of uh, accommodation. Still, what is, for almost all of them, uh, the same is that they are money rich but time poor. They don't have much holidays. Uh, each day they're not working, they're losing a lot of money, they're not, which is not earned. So they are all interested in intensive experiences. They are not coming to Europe for holidays, even if they come for leisure. They come for experiences and things to tell their friends on WeChat uh, back home what they have been doing. Every 30 minutes, something must happen. So, and uh, diversification also means you can oversell a place. So this is an example from shopping, uh, from, a, from a survey we do together with another company called Eye to Eye. And you can see uh, that Louis Vuitton used to be the most famous brand in China. Everybody wanted to have Louis Vuitton. Uh, and now, if you look at this, they have been going down to number nine or number 10, and other brands have taken, more, more specialized brands have taken their place. And the brand which is the most famous one is called Other. So you see diversification, smaller brands, uh, which are more saying, okay, for my lifestyle, for my self-definition, this is what I, what I want to buy so to, to, to show who, who I am. So this is also for, for travel uh, that people say, okay, I am uh, interested in, in this, uh, in uh, wine production. I want to go to places. I want to learn how wine is made or cheese is made or sausage is made, whatever. So foodies, big trend in China. People become interested in international food. Uh, demographic development. We see more and more young people and old people. So Chinese outbound tourists are more than half people born in the 1980s and 1990s. But we see that the, the fastest growing market segment are uh, citizens 60 plus. And we also see more and more kids traveling. And this is not uh, astounding. If you look at this number, I mean, this is one of the simple stories why to show the success of China. In 1960, the average uh, life expectancy was 43 years 
Now it's 76 years. So this is an achievement, uh, which results in more than 200 million Chinese people are aged 60 and over. And some of them have money or their kids have money and feel uh, anyway guilty that they don't care of their parents enough to pay for them uh, to traveling. And will this develop further? Yes, this is a, a graph. This is Asia Pacific in general, but China it looks similar. And you can see that for, uh, so we are here, 2016, for young people below 14, already the number is, is going down. And for people between 15 and 39, uh, it is just reaching uh, the Zenith, so this will go down. So what is still growing for the next 30 years or so is uh, people aged 40 and older, and especially 60 and older. So this is a totally new market, which we have not much experience with yet. Uh, older Chinese people with money, with international travel experience, and with more time. Good for us. One example of how industries react into this, Viking Cruise uh, has decided to start next year uh, to have river cruises on the Danube River, on the Rhine River, especially for Chinese uh, customers. So, and they are targeting mostly uh, families with, uh, with kids or small uh, core families, so four grandparents, two parents, uh, one child, because it is so convenient uh, way of traveling. So one of the hottest topics we discuss in tourism at the moment, and I've been to many conferences this year, and everywhere this topic crop up is dispersion. So uh, UNWTO is saying in 2030, we will have 1.8 billion, from now 1.1 billion international travels. And many of these will be Chinese. How on earth are we coping with that? So the uh, some, some Marco Square in, in uh, Venice cannot be extended. Uh, the place in front of the Tower of London cannot be made bigger. So uh, we need to bring these people to other places in the destinations and maybe also other times of the year. Otherwise, uh, well, we have many places or already at carrying capacity. Uh, and this is something which is not happening. So this is an example from Australia, and you can see that four or five Chinese FITs, not package tourists, are staying in, in the main tourist regions, whereas only half of the British, for instance, are doing that. So this is a very important development. And for us in Europe, that means we need to offer better and more customized products to tell Chinese tourists why they uh, should travel in January to Ljubljana instead of coming in the summertime to the places everybody's going. And I think the, the China, EU China Year of Tourism 2018 uh, ha is one of the steps in this direction. And uh, from what we heard in the beginning from, from Eric, so this will be a, a good chance to develop uh, the understanding and, and, the, and the products uh, to lure Chinese customers at other times of the year and to other places. Uh, bearing in mind that they're not coming for sunshine, they're not coming for beach, so they are interested in experiences in doing a lot of things. So this is a positive step for us. And positively also, we see more and more uh, direct air links to uh, non-capital EU airports. So here in Britain, since June, Manchester Airport has a direct link to China, uh, which means that Chinese tourists who have already been to London before uh, fly to Manchester and, and visit the north of England and maybe Scotland without ever touching London, uh, which is very good. For, uh, so there's enough space for the first time visitors coming to London. Uh, so uh, supporting dispersion will, I think, for the next 10, 15 years be an important topic we all have to work with. And uh, so also what was briefly mentioned uh, uh, with uh, the new forms and the, the, the Chinese way of looking what is interesting in, in Europe. So uh, uh, just one example is rats tourism. So in China last year there was a billion travels organized by the, the government and by the party uh, to those places which are connected to the history of the revolution of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and what has happened last year is that since last year, red tourism has al is also now a part of international tourism. So there were uh, contracts uh, signed last year. Uh, you see the heads of CNTA 
uh, Mr. Li Jin Sao and Mr. Du Diang, uh, with Russian counterparts. Uh, and this year it has been decided that there should be city partnerships started with foreign cities uh, with a revolutionary history. And uh, so, of course, we have uh, Wuppertal and we have Trier, the birthplaces of Marx and Engels, and we have, for instance, of course, London, uh, Highgate and the British Library, and we have Manchester, where Engels have been working for a long time. Uh, so, for instance, this is a four meter high statue of uh, Engels, which is a gift of the Chinese people standing in Wuppertal in front of the Engels house. So, uh, there is a lot of interest in the, in, uh, the story of uh, uh, the socialist movement, which, of course, is first of all uh, something which happened in, in Europe. And the Chinese government is even building their own places outside. So this is on top. This is the hall where the Communist Party in 1928 had a party congress because they couldn't do this in China anymore, which has been renovated as a personal initiative of uh, Mr. Xi Jinping. And uh, closer to us here, uh, close to Paris, this building uh, is connected to the story that in the 1920s, uh, a lot of Chinese leaders, including Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, came to France as uh, worker students and had their first contact with uh, left, idea, left wing ideas. So this has been opened all in the last few months as places for red tourism to go there. And so certainly for a destination, if you have something which can be built into this stream, uh, you can be sure to have lots and lots of Chinese tourists coming for that reason. Because as our research showed, if a Chinese official delegation, which has now more difficulties to get the permission to travel with government money, if they include this kind of items into the itinerary, it's much easier for them to get the permission to, to travel. Uh, last but one point, something we have to, to mention, that of course in the last few months, uh, the fear uh, to be a victim of a terrorist attack uh, to be in some uh, not necessarily uh, harm, but in some disorganization because of the refugee crisis uh, has been growing. And so we can read some of the quotes. This is from one of our recent uh, research where people are saying, uh, I'm, I'm worried. So, and uh, some say I'm worried to be the victim. Some say I'm worried maybe something happens, even I'm not the victim, maybe the airport is closed for three days and then my travel plan is uh, put in, into, uh, gets problems. So this is something which had the, uh, the result that we see that for the, in the last few months uh, in, in some countries, uh, quite negative development. And Switzerland is an example. In August we say, we see minus 29% arrivals, even so in Switzerland nothing happened. But Switzerland is seen as a part of Western Europe and so, Western Europe is seen as, as dangerous, which means not that they're they not coming. Uh, it means that, as you can see, they go to, for instance, Eastern Europe, where uh, the perception is that this is more safe. So Poland, Serbia, and so on, they still had, until now, more than 30% growth rates, whereas uh, most Western European countries are happy if they have zero. And the uh, French government, I think, basically stopped publishing data uh, for, for good reasons. And the last point, of course, uh, what we are talking about here, the EU China Year of Tourism, is an opportunity, I think, and this is something to stress for all European countries, not only for the, for the big five or so, uh, because uh, it is an opportunity, and I'm quoting Eduardo Santander here, who will speak to us after the coffee break himself, uh, that this is an opportunity to explore the market and to learn how to attract uh, visitors and offer them the best experience. And this is something I think we should have to take really serious. I think you said something very profound here. So it's not just to say, okay, how can we get more visitors? Uh, but to say, how can we offer them the best experience? And this, of course, means you have to understand what they see as good service and good quality, not what we necessarily see as good service and as good quality. So, uh, and, and uh, so this is uh, also, of course, attracting them based on engaging uh, in Chinese social media and in, uh, in uh, listening to what 
Chinese are looking at. So one of our instruments, which is very successful, is, is netnography, simply looking what are the Chinese in the social media talk among themselves about your destination, your product, your service, your company, because they do already. Uh, and they can see that what they like, what they don't like is very often very different from what the companies themselves think is important. So let me finish uh, almost on time uh, with an outlook. What we see is, uh, yes, the Chinese economy is slowing down. So we are now at around 6%, whatever number you want to believe. Uh, but this will not mean that the reduction of the Chinese outbound tourism uh, will take place because, as we said, 5% of the Chinese have a passport. So this top 5% of the Chinese we are uh, being so polite to call the middle class uh, are getting maybe a bit slower rich now, but they still get rich and still... Uh, so if you're selling Maseratis in China, maybe you have a bit of a problem now, but to sell a trip to Europe for $5,000 or $10,000 uh, is for the majority of these customers not uh, a big problem to, to still finance. So visa will be a very, very important topic, and uh, I think we can all be happy to hear that there is something uh, in the pipeline because, of course, this is for everybody uh, the most important question. And with all the other countries having been uh, so proactive already, and you have about 70 countries for, uh, where you don't need a visa at all anymore as, as a Chinese. So this is where we have to catch up. But what we already have achieved now means that it's easier now to travel uh, to Schengen countries and also to travel out of Schengen and back into Schengen, which before was, was not possible. So we clearly see the trend that package tours where you, have, you travel with strangers uh, according to an itinerary which you hadn't any word into, that this is decreasing dramatically and you have more and more semi-organized trips where the, the, the Chinese travelers uh, maybe buy their own air ticket and their, their hotel nights, maybe even rent a car, but book some activities, some experiences they can't organize by themselves easily in advance. And you have uh, Chinese online travel agencies, OTAs, uh, who are providing these services. So uh, the market will become more and more fragmented and you will have more and more niches uh, you can serve. And don't be afraid of niches. In China, a niche is still half a million, a million, two million people. So. Therefore, I, I would say if uh, uh, the, the opportunity of the, the bridge project and of the 2018 EU China year uh, is used, as we have been hearing from our guests from Brussels, it is planned to be, I think this is a very, very good opportunity to get Chinese customers who stay longer, who go to more different spaces at different times of the year, who spend more and have a more enjoyable experience. Thank you very much. And with this, I can uh, give you the good news that we have a coffee break now. And the coffee break will be where? Just, Just outside. Just outside. OK. And we, we need to be back here at 4 o'clock sharp. Yes, 4 o'clock sharp we will continue. So you have exactly half an hour. Enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>